Well, hello, church. If you would open to Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1. Y'all know we started uh, a series in the book of Daniel last week. And we're kind of going to be in chapter 1 and chapter 2. And I'm only going to read two verses right now for us. So chapter 1, verse 4, and then I'll read verse 17. This is God's Word. It describes uh, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and it says, They were youths without blemish, of good appearance, and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. I'll go to verse 17. It says, as for these four youths, God gave them, God gave them learning and and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. And so, Father, we go to Your Word, and we come to You right now. Because we need something that we probably don't think we need right in this moment. We, we need Your wisdom. And You're the God who gives wisdom. And so Lord, we pray that wisdom be given to us. Old and young. Those who have wisdom, that they would receive more. And those that don't yet have it, to gain it. And we know, God, You can give wisdom if we will ask for it and seek it. And so, Father, we pray that these things happen for the glory of Your Son and the advancement of Your kingdom. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to talk tonight uh, about preparing our children for Babylon. And... uh, Last week, I I tried to establish that Babylon in Scripture is a type of the world. And so oftentimes it shows up in in the end of the Bible in Revelation, uh, and it kind of represents all of the fallen world. And so I want to talk about preparing our children for Babylon. And and this is, as soon as I started reading in Daniel uh, a month or so ago, this this was laid on my heart heavy. And I do believe the Lord wants to speak to us about this. Um, I'm sure uh, many of you have heard this if you haven't said it yourself. Uh, I don't know if I want to bring children into this sinful world. Or I don't know if I want to raise children to live in this world. And there's parents uh, that are not wanting to have children. Christian parents, I'm sure well-meaning, that are scared to bring children into the world as it is today. And one thing I'm hoping for, for this uh, sermon is that our minds would change about that. So, before we get there, I, what we need to kind of back up and establish something if we're going to talk about parenting with, what, with this text and ask what age are these young men? It calls them in verse 4 youth, but we're talking about Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. How old are they? And um, because their age is going to matter for what I'm going to argue from this passage. Some scholars believe uh, that they were exiled into Babylon as children. They were basically young boys. Um, maybe six, eight, ten years old. Uh, I don't think there's any reason from the text to believe that. The majority of scholars uh, and historians do believe that uh, these These four men were exiled into Babylon when they were in their late teens, maybe 17, 18 years old, or even their early 20s. And um, that's what I want to argue for. I I believe youths here, when it's talking about the use of Jewish royalty and nobility, it says there, look at how it describes them in verse 4. They're without blemish, good appearance, skillful in all wisdom, Endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, competent to stand in the king's palace. 
I don't know about you, that doesn't sound like a six-year-old or an eight-year-old or a 10-year-old to me. Um, if I'm the king and I'm bringing in uh, some of these exiled uh, Jews that I want to help strengthen my kingdom, I'm not grabbing the six and the eight-year-old to come help me as experts that will be able to stand in my palace and help me govern with power and, and rule this nation. I think uh, more likely we would, he would be grabbing someone who is, uh, in, in our terms, just graduated high school or just graduated college. And um, in other words, I don't think we have to read the word youth as children, uh, but I think we can read it as young men. And remember how this word youth is used in other places in Scripture. Paul calls Timothy a youth. Um, so we know that Paul first met Timothy when Timothy was 14, or I'm sorry, 16 years old. First time Paul meets Timothy. 14 years later, Paul meets Timothy again on his second missionary journey. So Timothy would have been 30. A few years after that, Timothy is then the pastor in Ephesus, and Paul writes him a letter. That letter is 1 Timothy. And in chapter 4 of 1 Timothy, Paul says this to this man in his mid-30s, let no one despise you for your youth in his mid-30s. All right, so we have a usage of the, of the word youth in the Bible of a man in his mid-30s. And then we have other historians that say in this day that the word youth could be applied to, to people up to 40 years old. And so uh, I, I don't think that these, these guys are, are, are children um, entering into Babylon. I think they are at the very least 17, 18 uh, more likely their early 20s. And here's why that's significant, because if they enter Babylon as children, that creates a whole other set of issues. And I'll say something about that in a second. If they enter as young adults, that's going to support what I want to argue for. Uh, it's interesting. Some people, uh, actually, they'll take this passage and they'll use it to argue that we should send our children into public school. Because they'll say, look, Here's four children that entered into Babylon and changed it for good. And so therefore, we should send our children into the public school system to change it for good. And they'll use this as an argument uh, for that. Uh, but if these are not children, but 17, 18, 20-year-old young men, then it would, it would actually be an argument for the opposite. It would say, let's not send our children into Babylon until they're ready and competent to handle Babylon. Um, and I will say, I, I do think there are, uh, I'm not saying that Christians can't send their children into public school. Uh, I do think there are certain circumstances that could be the wise thing to do. But I would say that is not the norm. It's the exception. So I'll, I'll end that there. Um, now, what are, I think that these, these four young men, as before they get into Babylon, had a, had a really thorough education in the Scriptures. Now, why, why would I say that? Um, it was interesting. I was, I was listening to this, uh, this scholar that wrote a commentary on Daniel, this interview with him, and he made this kind of offshoot statement about King Josiah. And I'm like, oh, I need to study this out. I started kind of researching King Josiah, rereading some passages, and I discovered that King Josiah, you read about him in 2 Kings, all four of these young men grew up under his rule, under King Josiah's reforms. And let me remind us quickly what happened under King Josiah. If you read at the very end of 2 Kings, you will see this, it's really depressing, honestly. You read, and it's very long and drawn out, just this degenerative cycle of one bad king after another bad king after another bad king, and it's like each of them is getting more evil and corrupt than the, than the one before them, until King Josiah. And what's a little bit strange about King Josiah is he's eight years old when he's appointed as king. And, and by the time he's 16, one of his men, uh, and he's, he's actually called by many scholars the best king that Israel ever had, even more than David for certain things that he accomplished under his rule. 
uh, King Josiah was, a, was an amazing king for Israel. And it, at 16 years old, he, he tells one of his servants to go do something in the temple. And this servant accidentally finds the scriptures. Ac- I mean, how do you accidentally find the scriptures? They, they had been lost for hundreds of years. He accidentally finds a scroll and then brings it to King Josiah. King Josiah at 16 years old says, open it, read it. He begins to read the scriptures. He's never, King Josiah has never heard this. He's a king of Israel, never heard the scriptures, breaks down and begins to cry out for mercy and rip his clothes just in terror of, of God's judgment on their nation because of their sin. I, I mean, how do you lose the Bible? How, how, how do you lose for hundreds of years the scriptures and then accidentally find it in the temple? But this is how evil and corrupt that this nation was at this point. So what they think that many, many of the historians believe that what they actually found was a scroll containing Deuteronomy, the book of Deuteronomy, which is interesting because Deuteronomy is a summation of the first four books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. And you, and you really read Deuteronomy and you're like, it's not really necessary because every, all of this stuff was said before. It's not really saying anything new, but the whole reason Deuteronomy was written, listen, because the parents of the first generation that came out of Egypt didn't teach their children the law and the covenant. And so now Moses has to reteach them all of this because of the failure of the first generation to teach their children. And it's interesting, you see, when you read Deuteronomy, you keep seeing it say things like, teach your children these things. Tell them to your children when you sit in your house and when you go. And so what I want to say here is that Josiah, he's significant because he begins to command that the Scriptures be read before all of Israel. And he gathers the whole family, all of them, everybody in Israel, come and listen. And the Word of God begins to be taught again. And sacrifices are beginning to be made for sin, and the Passover is reestablished. And then he begins to break down pagan idols and altars to pagan gods that, that Israel had set up to worship other gods. He begins to tear these down. So there's this revival and reformation uh, happening. And who is there watching all of this? Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. This is their environment of their spiritual upbringing. This this Old Testament revival. And their parents were there. You know, notice that all these men have Hebrew names. All their names say something about Yahweh. Their parents were believers. Their parents were in this revival that's happening. And now they're being formed. So imagine they would have been sitting there in these revival meetings as the scriptures being read and taught. They would have been taking the Passover again with their family learning what their Hebrew names meant, learning about God. They would have been watching this zeal of this man, King Josiah, going around and destroying these altars to pagan gods and saying there is one God who is worthy of worship. We will not worship another. These these young boys grew up watching this. And I believe this is why they were prepared to enter Babylon Which brings up our first point of application for us. Uh, Our children will not morally stand in Babylon if we don't give them a Christian education when they're young. And when I say Christian education, I don't just mean, um, you know, a Bible class or, or, or a prayer class. Christian education, I mean math, science, literature, spelling, history, grammar, ethics, philosophy, logic, all of it it taught in reference to God. Not from an evolutionary standpoint. Not from a purely pragmatic standpoint. Hey, learn all of this so you can make money because if you make money, you'll be happy and you'll have a good life. Not that type of education, but all these topics in their relation to God. That's what we mean by Christian education. You know, there's a lot of 
parents who put their children in Christian school or homeschool, but it's not God-centered. It's still man-centered. A lot of parents put their kids in Christian or homeschool, and the aim is just moralism. Hey, just, you know, don't be like the bad people, be like the good people. You know, it's just a... There's no, there's no Spirit of God conforming their character into the image of Christ. There's no emphasis at the transformation of character by the power of the Holy Spirit. Many parents who put their kids in Christian and homeschool, yet the aim is really just to get a good AT, ACT score or good grades so that you can then get into a good college. And if you get a good college, you can get a good paying job. And if you get a good paying job, you've made it. That's not a Christian education. Um, I love what the, the, the headmaster uh, of the school that we have our kids in, which is not a perfect school uh, by any means, but I, I love what he said the other day in the parent orientation. Um, he said, he kind of laid out the development of a, of a child going through the school for, for those years. And he said, step one would be, and this would be the youngest grades, uh, that they, to help them understand there is a creator God and then that creator God made everything and rules everything and he's put as an authority over them parents. And you say, well, that's kind of a low bar, you know, to teach little kids that. No. That's an extremely high bar to teach children that God is... I mean, how many adults don't know those two basic things and it ruins their lives? To know God is... All, all authority is in Him, and He has put parents as the chief authority over them. And that children see that as a good thing. That's a high bar for a young child. And then into the elementary, uh, to, get in, uh, to begin to emphasize loving and serving others as God in Christ has loved and served us. And then getting into middle school, he, he's talked about how there needs to be a strong emphasis on self-denial so that you can begin to love others, which is what you were made to do. And then into the upper high school age, they need to begin to begin to uh, defend the faith and know how to give a reason for the hope that they have and be able to help someone else become a Christian and know Christ. And in all of this, the formation of their character into the image of Christ. And so, the reason I'm even bringing that up is I think that's the type of education that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego got before they got to Babylon. And, and I can say that because when you, when you begin to look at their lives, uh, they know God. They know His authority. They know His wisdom. They know His power. They're very aware of who God is and, and, and that He is the King of kings and the King of kingdoms. And his sovereignty and his rule and his reign, they know who God is. And they, they have a heart to love and to serve Babylon, which I'll talk about at the end of this. They have a heart to love and to serve Babylon. Uh, they have integrity to stand against paganism and to say there is only one God that is worthy of worship, not hundreds of gods. And so I think that if our children are going to be prepared for Babylon, there's one primary thing that I, I believe that they need. Wisdom. Wisdom. Hukma. It's what it says in verse 4. That they were skillful in all hukma. Wisdom. That's what wisdom is. It's, it's skill in living a godly life in this world. That's what wisdom is. And these men had it when they got into Babylon. They had acquired that before they got into Babylon. Um, I, I've mentioned this before, but uh, Dan Goldman is a man who wrote a book probably 20, 25 years ago. Um, many of y'all have probably heard of EQ, uh, not IQ. We know IQ with intelligence, but EQ. And he kind of coined this term, uh, emotional intelligence. And it's interesting when you begin to look at what EQ is because it's very similar to what the Bible calls wisdom. And, um, and so I think what these men have is not only a high IQ, they didn't just go into Babylon with a high IQ, they went into Babylon with a high EQ, with a high 
emotional intelligence or wisdom, which is the ability to apply right emotions at the right time in the right way. So it's the ability to hate what is, uh, hate the right things at the right times, to love the right things at the right times, to say and do the right things at the right times which means they weren't impulsive men, emotionally unstable, swayed by every passion and sensual thought. Wisdom is the ability not to entertain every thought and pursue every emotion. It's the awareness that our hearts often deceive us, very often deceive us, but God doesn't. Wisdom is clear thinking that weighs out the consequences for actions. It's the renewed mind that can test and discern what is good and acceptable and perfect. So maybe you found this. Maybe you found that it's much easier to say you're a Christian or to explain Christianity than to actually live the Christian life. Because we don't want to be... You know, we don't want to be the, the guy who has his theological library all situated and he can explain all these things, but he can't get out of bed in the morning. And he can't hold down a job. We don't want to be the woman who, who has her daily devotions but isn't hard at work. We don't want to be someone who's diligent at work, but then they come home and they're enslaved to entertainment or food. We don't want to be the person who can at work speak nice things to other people and talk all kind and gentle and and then we come home and lash out on our families. Wisdom, a high EQ, enables you not to be like that because wisdom aims at the, the whole person, the formation of the whole person. And these young men entered Babylon fully formed, not perfect, but wise. And, and, and parents, if there's anything we need to give our children as a gift when they leave our house, and we do need to kick them out at some point. <laughs> I'm far from that, but uh, we don't want to just say, hey, time to go. Here's keys to this car, or here's a nice apartment, or here's all of uh, your college paid for. We need to say, I've, I've given you wisdom. I mean, what a gift. What a gift to give to your children. You just read the Proverbs. I mean, it's the Father's main aim. He's like, son, get wisdom and you'll know how to handle money. Get wisdom and you'll know how to handle your emotions and the temptations that you struggle with. And you won't commit adultery if you find wisdom, son. Get wisdom and you'll work hard and not be lazy. Get wisdom and your children and your spouse will be blessed, son. But get above everything else. Seek, find, and prize wisdom. This is the father in Proverbs. Just single-minded focus to give his child wisdom. And I think our Wisdom is what our children need to be prepared for Babylon. And fathers, there is no one that God intends to give that wisdom to your children more than you. And that's not to devalue the role of mothers at all. But when we read the Old and New Testament, it continually emphasizes that fathers are the primary dispensers of wisdom to their children. Which means, brothers, uh, we can't be working too much. A lot of men, we want to work. We want to provide good things for our families. We find, out, we find good ways to, to just keep working. So we can get nice things. And we can get a nice house. And we can send them off to college. And we can do all these things. But if it's to the neglect of giving our children wisdom, it's wrong. It's wrong. Uh, there was a man once who uh, he got very upset at me because I rebuked him uh, because he was neglecting his wife. 
And, and then he said this to me and, and just very angry. He said, you don't know how good of a father I am. And I said, sir, if you were half the father you claim to be, you'd go home and show your children how to love your wife. Because we can't just tell our kids, get wisdom, learn this, do this. We must live it before them. And we often live it before them by showing them what we value the most. Do we value God the most? Do we value His Word? Do we value His people? Do we value uh, self-denial for the sake of serving others? Or do we just value entertainment and fun and money? Which is so easy to do in this country, isn't it? I don't think these four young men just had parents that were Christian parents and modeled all these things. I, I think we have to give credit to the covenant community that they grew up in, where God's Word was put first in worship. And I think, let me just say a word practically to, to our church on this. Um, many of you who have been here a while know this, but I, I think this is a good opportunity to, to say this again. It, you know, if, we, if what I'm saying is true, and this is really accurate, that wisdom needs to be the main thing that we give our children then there's just simply some things we're going to do as a church that are different than what other churches do that might elevate entertainment or fun or, or, or other things as ultimate. It's just going to look different. I mean, one, one practical difference might be, uh, from, and I'll, I'll speak for myself, I would rather have my children around wise adults, people who've already acquired some wisdom, than just always being around children who haven't yet gained it. Because Proverbs says you learn wisdom by walking with the wise. That's why we want our kids in here. That's why we want our kids in, in city groups. There's something that does to them. Even if they don't understand everything that's going on, they're watching. They're gaining wisdom, hopefully. I mean, I, I don't want my children's view of church to be light shows and loud music and, and all-night lock-ins. I want my children to see regenerate believers who love the Lord and who love each other and who know something of the joy of self-denial for the sake of love. I mean, for a child to grow up seeing that week in and week out, it's got to do something to you. I, I, I'm very aware that, that, you know, maybe even someone's thinking that... Uh, you sound old-fashioned. And uh, I would say I'm probably more old-fashioned than you realize. Because what I'm saying is something the church has believed and taught for 2,000 years. It wasn't until the 1960s that youth programs began. Now, churches catechized their kids for a long, long time. But a lot of the things that we think are essential for raising children in our day are new. And, and I'm not saying that because they're bad. I'm just saying that so we don't put too much hope in them. Believe it or not, I know it could be hard to fathom, but the church didn't always have children's programs. And believe it or not, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't get prepared for Babylon in the youth group. They just didn't. And uh, again, we're not, uh, please don't hear me saying that youth programs or children's uh, ministries are, are in any way bad. Um, I'm just saying that godly parents in a healthy local church are far better and are sufficient. And I do hope we have youth programs and Lord willing we get a building and we can do more for our children, but I just don't want us to hope too much in those things. We need to put the weight where the Scripture puts the weight. These four men were not prepared for Babylon by a cool young youth pastor and fun games. They were prepared for Babylon because they saw King Josiah and other men elevating the Word of God to the point where they said, no God is worthy of worship but this God. And, and he began to tear down pagan idols. That prepared them for Babylon. 
this, this awareness of God, which is what this is all about, an awareness of God among a people and to grow up in that environment is a massively formative thing. Now, now here's the balance. Uh, because I, I, there's, there's dangers on either side of this. Uh, you, you could be tempted to be prideful if you hear what I'm saying and you're like, well, I'm doing pretty good on this. Or the other danger could be that you go, well, man, I failed more than I realized. And you could be overly discouraged. And so here's the balance Scripture gives. We need to strive to give our children, as we've said, a, a Christian education aimed at wisdom. Put our time into that. Put money into that. Pray toward that end. Strive toward that end. But recognize the sovereignty of God's Spirit to give our children life. Guys, we know. We've seen this. You, your, your kids can uh, grow up in a godly home. They can be in a church that preaches the gospel week in and week out. That You can make good education choices. And then they grow up and walk away. We know that. We know this is no perfect formula that if you do these three basic things, your kids are going to love the Lord and be fully prepared for Babylon. They won't be apart from the Spirit of God, but we know the Spirit of God often works through that Christian education aimed at wisdom. He does. I mean, what are, guys, what are the other options? Like, what do we do? Not prepare our children for Babylon? <laughs> I mean, this is what we do. But we don't trust ourselves. We, we rely on the grace of God. Now here's one other point from the text that we need to see regarding wisdom. And I'll just read this. The wisdom needed to live for Christ in Babylon is often given when they get there, not before. So much of what our children will need for Babylon isn't something they're going to get in our home necessarily. It'll be given to them when they get there. And I get this from the text. We see Daniel chapter 1, verse 17. Uh, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom. God did that. Verse 19, among all them, none of them is found like Daniel and Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah. That's their Hebrew names. And in every matter of wisdom and understanding in which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the other magicians and enchanters that were in his kingdom. If we jump to chapter 2, we see the same thing. Verse 30, Daniel has the wisdom to say this. This mystery has been revealed to me. He doesn't just say, well, my parents taught me all of this stuff earlier on, and I went to this school, and you know, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because of any wisdom that I have more than all the other living but in order that the interpretation may, may be made known to the king. Or chapter 2, verse 23, To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and might, and have now made known to me what we, what we ask of you, for you have made known to us the king's matter. You know, wisdom is often just knowing you don't have it, but God does. I do think that's the wisest thing. You know someone has wisdom when they actually realize, I don't have wisdom. Like James. James actually says this a few times, the book of James. It says that wisdom comes from above. It says that twice. Wisdom comes from above. Part of being a wise person is recognizing you don't have wisdom. God gives wisdom. And Daniel sees that. Chapter 2, verse 19. Blessed be the name of the God forever to whom belongs wisdom and might. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. So that's, that's important. And please notice what he says here in verse 19. He gives wisdom to the wise. So someone has wisdom and then he gives them more. And I think the parenting principle is pour as much wisdom into them, but don't think you're going to fill them up with all the wisdom they need. You need God to give wisdom. 
to them beyond what you can give them. Let me, let me move toward closing. Um, I, I started off saying that uh, a lot of parents are scared to bring their children into this, this world, uh, and we can understand why. And, and so they're, they're fearful of bringing children up or even birthing children into the world. Um, I think we should, we should actually not fear that at all, but we should take on a proactive strategy. We should really be saying, this Babylon, this world is so dark and evil. Oh God, please give us children to raise them up and send them out for the good of Babylon. That's the Christian response. And that's actually what's going on here in the text. Two, two final parenting lessons here. These will be quick. And I'll just put them in two different words. Salt and arrows. These two images are in, in this text. What do I mean by salt? So Daniel knew Jeremiah's prophecies. Jeremiah is, is living. We're going to read some of these if you read Kent's uh, reading plan for us this week. We'll get into Jeremiah. Jeremiah lives in the same time as Daniel. Okay, So Daniel knew what Jeremiah was prophesying. And in Jeremiah 29, he says this, verse 3, the letter was sent to Babylon to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. So Jeremiah's letter was sent to king of Babylon. It said, so apparently King Nebuchadnezzar was to read this to all the exiles that are in Babylon, the Jewish exiles. Verse four, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Here's what he tells them. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat the produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there. Do not decrease. Now listen to verse 7. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. Do good. Don't just hide out. Oh no, Babylon's evil. We better just stay in our house all the time. That's not what he tells them to do. He says, Seek the welfare of this city that I've sent you. Pray to the Lord on its behalf for or because in its welfare, in Babylon's welfare, you will find welfare. Now what I think he's saying among many things here is that these exiles aren't to just be uh, good citizens in the sense like, oh, look at all these good Jewish people. They're very nice to us. Uh, the, all the Jewish people are nice. You know, what, what God is telling them is you will find refuge or you will find blessing in Babylon's being blessed. He, he's, he's talking about them being salt. Now, maybe you've heard Jesus when Jesus says you are the salt of the earth. And we go, what is that? Well, it's flavoring. Salt flavors meat, you know. Salt. I think salt is more a preservative. I think that's more what Jesus meant. Salt preserves. And so what, what these Jews, these exiles are for Babylon is they are preservatives of God's grace to the nation of Babylon so that God doesn't destroy it in his wrath, but rather does good to Babylon. And he clearly does that through Daniel and the others as this story unfolds. I, I don't know if you remember, I mean, Sodom and Gomorrah. What is that prayer that Abraham prays for Sodom and Gomorrah? He says, uh, Abraham's going, Lord, please don't strike down this wicked city. I mean, there's 40 righteous here. Are you going to strike down the 40 righteous if there's 40 righteous? And he goes, no, not if there's 40. Well, there's 30. What if there's 30? No, not if there's 30. Well, what if there's 20? Would you, would you wipe it out if there's 20 righteous? And God says, no, I won't do that. What were those 20 righteous people? They were a preservative. They were holding back the wrath of God on that wicked city. That's what your children are to be for this world. Preservative, salt on the earth to hold back the judgment of God so that more can hear the gospel and be saved. That's one of the reasons we have kids. It's a big, big reason, but it's one of them. And then here's the other. Our children are also to be arrows shot into Babylon. So we go, oh man, I got a new baby. It's so cute. And it is. 
right? And we go, oh, I just, they're so cute. And how long will they stay this cute? And it's not very long. <laughs> it's, no, they, they're very cute for a long time. Um, but it's more, we're not just given kids to just enjoy. We're given kids as arrows. Psalms 127, 3 and 4 says, Children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of, uh, of the womb a reward, like arrows. They're like, children are, he says, they're like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. A lot of parents don't get that. We, we think of parenting in such a short-sighted way. We're like, okay, they're not going to sit through this service. They're going to be all loud. All right? I know these are like the little momentary things that we struggle with. But it's like, or we go, well, I just want to preach the gospel to them so they'll be saved. Well, that's certainly good. I just want to teach them wisdom so that they'll have a good life. Well, that's good, but it's still very short. What's the aim? It's not just, it's like we want to send them out into the world, but we aren't ready yet because we're still sharpening them. They're meant to be shot out and not for the destruction of the world, but for the saving of the world. For the good of Babylon. Guys, our kids, uh, I don't need to tell you this, you know this, but they're blessings to you. And they're blessings to the church. And they're salt to the earth. And they're arrows that we want to sharpen and prepare to be sent out into Babylon for the good of Babylon. Let's pray for our children. Let's pray for ourselves that God help us to do this. Father, uh, Lord, we want to pray two things. We want to pray, Father, that You would help those of us who are parents and as a local church to prepare our children for this world that they will live in. They're so young right now. They're guarded from so much evil. And we're thankful for that. But Lord, we know the day is coming when they will be exposed to things that are horrible. And Lord, we pray that You would help us to prepare them. Not to hide them from the world, but to send them out as arrows for the good of Babylon. To advance the kingdom on this earth. And God, we pray for what only You can do that You would work in their hearts, that they would acquire wisdom, that they would seek it, that they would prepare themselves. Oh God, would You get the hearts of our children and draw them to Yourself, that they would know You, that they would love You, that they would treasure You, and that they would walk with You from a young age. Lord, we thank You for Your Son and what He accomplished on the cross that is the aim and the focus and the driving force behind all of this. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.